Hi and welcome and uh, we're going to be looking this time at Revelation 21 and 22 which you might be pleased about. A nice end to, to the Revelation and a lovely end to the whole of the scriptures actually and uh, yeah very positive end. So let's dig into that in a minute. I've just spent about 20 minutes trying to get the lighting right so hopefully it's okay. Um, and uh, perhaps as it's possibly the last one, we'll start with something a bit different. So, Pastor dies and is waiting in line at the pearly gates. In front of him is a guy in sunglasses, loud shirt, leather jacket and jeans. St Peter calls the man forward. Who are you so I can decide whether or not to let you into the kingdom of heaven? I'm George, retired airline pilot from Heathrow. St. Peter consults his list, he smiles and says, take this silk ro robe and golden staff and enter the kingdom. The pilot goes into heaven with his robe and staff. Next, it's the pastor's turn. He stands tall. I'm Pastor Steve, pastor of Full Life Pentecostal Church for over 30 years. St. Peter looks at his list. Take this cotton robe and wooden staff and enter the kingdom. He says, hey, wait a minute. The pilot got a silk robe and golden staff. I got cotton and wood. How can this be? Peter responded, Up here we go by results. When you preached, people slept. When he flew, people prayed. There you go. Don't know about the theology, but a good story anyway. Um, so, Revelation 21, 22. And, you know, we've got in the Bible, we've got Genesis and Revelation, the book and the Bible. We, and we've got in Genesis, the original garden that was the source of curse, of a curse and of death and so on. And of the place of human disobedience is now turned into sort of like an urban garden or a garden city, if you like, where nations can live in peace and there's blessing and life and the curse is broken and... Uh, Death is no more. How beautiful. Revelation 21, full of stunning imagery and scriptural images. It draws on some of the great text in the Old Testament. Some of the, the ones that you know you can draw out and, and enjoy. The ones in Isaiah, such as chapter 54, chapter 60, and um, chapter 65 and 66. Images in places like Isaiah about the temple, and about the priests, including the hope of a new temple, which you can read about in Ezekiel chapters 40 through to 48. And all this seems to be brought together in this stunning crescendo at the end. And in the Old Testament, there was a promise of a new creation. Um, you can see it in places like Isaiah chapter 55. In fact, I was going to look at that um, just briefly. You probably know this. Let's have a look. Isaiah um, 65. We'll look this up beforehand. Let's say, took a little while to get started. Isaiah 65 and verses uh, 17 to 19, which say, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing and her people as a joy. Okay, so I create a new heaven and a new earth. And you can turn over to chapter 66 and verses 22 and 23. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I, shall make, I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord etc etc so you know this promise of a new heaven a new earth a new creation is right there back in Isaiah and in Revelation the new Jerusalem is seen as the bride of the lamb the faithful people of God that's the new Jerusalem instead of an actual temple God and the lamb are the temple we see that in Revelation 21 verse 22 that's what it tells us that there isn't a need for a temple because God and the Lamb are the temple. And the New Jerusalem is God's alternative to the Roman Empire, the alternative to 
Babylon, to the um, subsequent incarnations of Babylon, wherever they pop up throughout human history. And we've talked about Babylon, of course, in previous ones and what that stood for and how that was Rome and so on. And uh, it's interesting to notice the size of the New Jerusalem in Revelation. Its size is 12,000 stadia, which is about 1,400 miles in length, width and height. Look at Revelation 21 and verse 16 to see some of that. The city has a footprint equal in, si in size to the whole mass of the Roman Empire. So it encompasses the whole world as John would have known it. In fact, I'm told if you were to measure from Rome to Jerusalem, so that's east to west, and from the northern edge of the, the Roman Empire to the southern edge of the Roman Empire, it would add up to 1,400 miles by 1,400 miles. Exactly these dimensions with the Isle of Patmos, where John wrote Revelation, exactly in the centre. Isn't that amazing? But that seems what it is. And it's a square, probably because the ancient ideal of perfection for a city seems to have been a square. We hear that Babylon itself was like a square. And in fact, it actually goes one stage further. God goes further and makes it a cube, not just a square, but a cube, perfect on every angle, every dimension, perfection. And of course, the Holy of Holies in the temple was a cube. Look at 1 Kings chapter 6 and verse 20 and the measurements there. It's a cube. And the children of God are the royal priests. You can look at, again, Revelation chapter 1 verse 6, check out chapter 5 verse 10 or chapter 20 verse 6. Shall I read that? Chapter 20 and verse 6 says... Uh, Wonderfully blessed are ho and holy are those who share in the first re resurrection. The second death holds no power of them, but they will be priests of God and of the Christ, and they will reign as kings with him a thousand years. And uh, as we look at this, it's interesting to see not just what's in the city, but what is absent from this city, this new Jerusalem. For instance, there is no sea. We're told that there's no sea. The sea in scripture is a symbol of chaos and evil. And the sea is not there. There's no death. There's no mourning or crying. No tears. Wonderful. No evil. Unclean or uncursed, accursed things or persons are allowed in. It's a place of purity, a place of safety. There is, as we've said, no temple because the Lord is its temple. There is no sun, moon or stars, and yet there is no light. And there are no closed gates. The gates remain open. It's almost like an opening. There's no restrictions. So what we have here is not only the climax of Revelation, but also the climax of the Bible and of the story of God and humanity. And it's important to realise that the, the vision of a new heaven and a new earth doesn't mean the destruction of the material world around us, but it's transformation. You know, I used to grow up with this idea that um, the earth was going to be totally destroyed and it would be the end of all that, you know. And we were going up into heaven um, and that's where we were, somehow floating around up there. That's not biblical Christianity. That is not what the Bible teaches. This earth is transformed but not destroyed. The culture of the beast, of death and fear are replaced by the culture of the lamb, life and peace. It's great news, isn't it, at the end. Eugene Peterson, commenting about heaven, said that heaven, the new heaven and earth is often replaced with just heaven and then completely misunderstood. He said, the frequency with which St John's vision of heaven is bloated by make-believe into an anti-biblical fantasy is one of the wonders of the world. Pretty straightforward speaking, isn't it? And N.T. Wright, um, who uh, is a, 
a well-known scholar, said Revelation 21 to 22 is the ultimate, ultimate rejection of all types of Gnosticism, of every worldview that separates the physical from the spiritual. I'll explain that briefly, but you know, there's often this view we have that the physical is bad and the spiritual is good and the physical is going to be left behind. The earth is going to be destroyed. Um, our bodies are going to go into the ground and we are going to float up as some sort of spirits and live on the clouds or something, plucking our harps and all that sort of thing. That is not scriptural. And you can see that actually in these last two chapters. Um, Gnosticism he's talking about, as I understand it, and it's a very involved, there's all different avenues of Gnosticism, but it's partly a rejection of the physical and it's infiltrated the church in every age. Whenever the physical, the physicalness of our bodies, the, phys the importance of that, the physicalness of Jesus and so on, wherever that is ignored, there's Gnosticism is creeping in. John wrote about it in his letters, so it was right the way back there, biblically. If you look at 1 John chapter 1, um, he talks about Jesus in deliberately anti-Gnostic language. Um, Gnostic, by the way, is spelled G-N-O-S-T-I-C. Um, he said, that which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked at and our hands have touched, when he's talking about Jesus. In other words, he's saying, this Jesus was a physical, a strong physical, a real human being, not some figment of our imagination. And it's a subtle attack on the Gnostic view that Jesus didn't come in the flesh. In fact, John goes on to say that um, that's the Antichrist spirit in 1 John 4, chapters 3 and 4. Any belief that separates flesh from spirit is Gnostic in origin, where the body is seen as unimportant, and often the physical world is seen as lower than the, than the spiritual. You know, Gnostic teaching varies widely, but, um, but scripture always sees the body as important. And salvation includes body, soul and spirit. Jesus saved the whole lot. And likewise, the, the physical earth is not destroyed in Revelation, but becomes eternal. Um, N.T. Wright or Tom Wright, Bishop of Durham and well-known theologian, um, he's authored over 40 books. He's, he teaches in places like um, Cambridge and Oxford and so on. He points out how Christians have often a totally misunderstood image of going to heaven when we die and leaving behind what we talk of as this veil of tears and our bodies. I'll quote from him actually in... Um, from a book that he's written. So in his book, Surprised by Hope, um, N.T. Wright says, in referring to Paul's uh, writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when he talks, Paul talks about the resurrection of the body, um, Paul finishes off by saying, um, therefore, my beloved ones, be steadfast, immovable, Always abounding in the hope of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your, your labour is not in vain. And Tom Wright says, what does he mean? How does believing in the future resurrection lead to getting on with work in the present? Quite straightforwardly. The point of the resurrection, as Paul has been arguing throughout the letter, is that the present bodily life is not valueless just because it will die. God will raise it to new life. What you do with your body in the present matters because God has a great future in store for it. And this, if this applies to ethics, as in 1 Corinthians 6, it certainly also applies to the various vocations to which God's people are called. What you do in the present by painting, preaching, singing, sowing, praying, teaching, building hospitals, digging wells, campaigning for justice, writing poems, caring for the needy, loving your neighbour as yourself, all these things will last into God's future. They're not simply ways of making the present life a little less beastly, a little more bearable, until the day when we leave it behind altogether. They are part of what we may call building for God's kingdom. So what he's trying to say is that the physical is important, both our physical bodies and also, and he goes on to talk more about this as well, 
the future of this earth. It's all important. So bearing that in mind, we see that in this Revelation 21, 22, that the boundary between heaven and earth is removed permanently. And God is present in the new Jerusalem in all his presence and glory. And this is not just a personal salvation either, by the way, this whole thing. This is about the healing of the nations. Look at chapter 22, verse 2. It is, as the rest of the Bible, about the creation of a people living in peace with God, one another, and creation. You see how I'm, it all comes in together? In Genesis, we're given the task to rule and to reign as benevolent keepers of this planet. Gnosticism might say the environment isn't important, but the biblical expectation is that we are called to steward the earth and be good stewards of the earth as well. And we must read Revelation not as a, with a view that looking for a way to escape from the earth, um, where we just see it bent on destruction and we therefore see our, don't see ourselves as responsible for it. That way, um, the environment and what we do with our bodies and the world around us are not relevant. Neither can we believe that we've got all the answers and that things like political action and so on are going to work and we create this wonderful new world of justice and so on. Um, this Shangri-La, this marvellous place, this utopia on earth. No, no, because it's only God can do that. Human effort can't bring about the kingdom of God. We have a role to play under the anointing of God's spirit, but, you know, it's not all about us. In the final two chapters of Revelation, we see um, it, Revelation, it will only be ushered in by God himself in his time. Our role is to share our faith and to walk as Jesus walked on this earth so that we may be partakers of the new heaven and the earth and others will come and join us in that too. Now there are those who will take these two chapters as almost totally literal, while well, some would say that most of this happened after the resurrection and particularly after the destruction of the temple in AD 70 and that was the end of the old covenant, you know, um, with the judgment on the Jewish nation in AD 70 as foretold by Jesus. Um, just to remind you, we spoke about that. AD 70 was when the Roman general Titus invaded Jerusalem and the destruction was horrendous. And yes, the temple was destroyed as prophesied by Jesus and um, many were slaughtered. Interestingly, the Christians, because in Matthew 24, Jesus said, when you see these things escape to the hills, I'm told that's what they did. The Christians who listened to what Jesus said, when they saw the Roman army surrounding Jerusalem, they escaped to the hills and, and they were saved. Now, I am told that not one Christian actually perished. I don't know how accurate that is. But it was a gruesome thing and a gruesome time. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, so there's these two views. Some would say take it literally and the dragon and all the rest of it and it's literally what would happen and that others would say actually most of this even into these two chapters already has happened interesting and uh, but they would say that we're still living we're living now in a time where Satan has been bound and heaven is gradually being unfolded upon this earth as Jesus makes all things new, as in it says in Revelation chapter 21, verse 5, Behold, I am making all things new. And they will say, this is what he's doing now. So we are in the millennium, we're in that time, Jesus is reigning in heaven, and we're actually in that place, but gradually Jesus is making all things new. Now I'm not saying which of those is right, and in fact, I wouldn't go with either of those. I think they're both extremes. But we have to take all these things and bring them together. And covering all the views in detail would be a major task. And particularly as it would affect not only Revelation, but all the rest of Revelation, all the other chapters, but places like Ezekiel and Isaiah and some of the other prophecies as well that are in there. We, it, the whole of the Bible is caught up in this amazing story. 
But I hope what it's done, looking at this, if, you know, is to get you to think outside the box a little bit. You may have been given a box in which your thoughts about revelation have been settled. And that's what happened to me. I was given a box of beliefs that settled my idea about revelation. And then somebody came along, as it were, or as I studied a bit more, actually. And um, the box started to break apart. And I began to realize there are other ways of looking at this. And rather than feeling that I'd lost something, I feel I've gained something because I've learned more about God's word that way. And I've begun to see that there may be a whole lot more in this than I'd first thought. And certainly, some of these views take away the fear um, that it's so easy to live under when you certainly all you can see is that the world is going to get worse we're going to go under tremendous persecution it's going to be horrible and we're most of us are going to be martyred but there at the end Jesus is going to ride in and rescue us and um, I'm not quite happy with that I find there are much more victorious ways of reading Revelation um, so you can go back to whatever interpretation you had at first. If you had one, you can go back to the box that you were given and the one that you were happy with, and that's absolutely fine. But at least you know there are other theories now that carry equal theological weight. So let me leave you with some questions to think on, and then I'll finish. So some questions to get you thinking. Number one, did you expect to spend eternity as a disembodied spirit without a body sitting somewhere perhaps on a, on a cloud perhaps not um but read perhaps one what did i say it was one corinthians 15 when paul talks about the the new spiritual body will be will be given two do you realize that you will spend eternity on this earth a remade earth a new earth but this earth, not totally destroyed, remade. Thirdly, do you realize that the body and the physical world are all part of God's salvation? Or have you been drawn into some sort of Gnostic viewpoint which sees the body as less important? You know, there are elements about who we are as people that will last for eternity. And it's interesting, you know, it's like the whole question, will they recognize me? when people recognize me in heaven well i think almost certainly they will and the reason is because there'll be something about the clothing with the new new eternal body that you'll have that will be linked to this body you have on this earth number four what are your responsibilities as a christian in this world now considering we see salvation as involving physical and spiritual realities what difference does that make so interesting thoughts i'll leave you with that and uh we may dip into a little bit more of this particularly if anybody's got any questions then if you can get them to me then i'll i'll try and deal with some of them but you know let's uh let's enjoy these last two chapters and the and just enjoy the po poetic beautiful overview of what it tells us about the future god bless